Claire Booth Luce, I am so happy to be here today in Washington, D.C. with you all to talk about the extraordinary Claire Booth Luce. This is the Conservative Women's Network, and we do this luncheon monthly. Bridget Wagner here at the Heritage Foundation and the Claire Booth Luce Policy Institute. We've been doing it for almost 20 years now. And I want to say a special thank you to the C-SPAN audience all over the world. So good to have you with us, and we love C-SPAN. And it's fitting that this talk today about the extraordinary Claire Booth Luce should be given at an event jointly sponsored by the Heritage Foundation, where Mrs. Luce was a member of the Heritage Board of Directors for many years, and the Claire Booth Luce Center for Conservative Women, which is inspired by the life and legacy of Claire Booth Luce. My name is Michelle Easton, and I'm the founder and president of the Claire Booth Luce Center for Conservative Women. We're out in Northern Virginia, in Herndon, Virginia. And when I founded the Institute 25 years ago, I chose the name because Claire Booth Luce was an incredible trailblazing woman. She modeled leadership for women both then and now. She was a pioneer in her time who served in a variety of leadership roles, many of which were first for, for women, and some of them are still quite rare. Claire Booth Luce was born in 1903. This is a picture of baby Claire. And her parents separated when she was very young. She was raised by a sometimes financially struggling mother, hardly the background that would have predicted the kind of extraordinary success in life that she achieved. Now, most teachers say it's impossible to be a great writer without also being a great reader. Knowledge builds on knowledge, forges the critical thinking skills that, mu that produce insight and understanding. Claire was a voracious reader as a child, and she was largely self-educated. Many are surprised to learn. She received only four years of what we today consider formal schooling, entering a Catholic school at the age of 12 and graduating first in her class from the Castle School in Terrytown, New York, when she was 16. During her years at Castle School, she began writing plays and poetry, and she became editor of the school paper. A Castle School classmate later said of Claire, quote, she was always interested in reading and learning about art or French and English history, driving herself through some inner compulsion to find out the why of everything. While she soaked in the tub, she'd have Plato propped up on the taps in front of her. Claire's early life circumstances motivated her to succeed, and her innate asking why for everything curiosity became the force that empowered her to achieve it. One biographer wrote, by the time she was 16, she knew what she wanted, and her ambitions were as big as her dreams, to be fluent in four languages, marry a publisher, and write something that would be remembered. She would achieve all three goals, and I'm going to talk a little about it. It's important for us to keep in mind the time period in which Claire lived. She was 13 years old when the first woman served in Congress. She was 16 years old before women had the right to vote nationally. Some states had allowed it earlier. She lived through both World Wars and the Great Depression. She was in the prime of her career while the Second World War was being fought. She was a congresswoman at a time when there were only 20 other women serving in the US Congress. And she was the first woman ever to hold a major ambassadorial post. She was America's ambassador to Italy. One of my favorite stories about Claire is how she landed her first job at Vanity Fair magazine. Claire had just finished a challenging marriage to an alcoholic socialite, George Brokaw, and she was increasingly discontented with an inner idleness she said she felt. She was ready for a career. So one night she was at a big dinner, uh, and Vanity Fair publisher Condé Nast was there. Condé Nast founded a vast media company um, including Vogue, The New Yorker, and Vanity Fair. That company still exists with uh, dozens of print and digital publications. But she asked Condé Nast if she could have a job at one of his organizations. As I'm sure you can imagine, Condé Nast was taken aback. This just wasn't done. He told Claire to come see him in three weeks and erroneously assumed she would lose whatever whim had struck her and forget all about it. But Claire was seldom one to forget. Three weeks later, she turned up at the Vanity Fair offices, only to find Condé Nast was in Europe. 
But before she left, she noticed this empty desk over in the corner, and she asked about it. And they said, oh, that was occupied by a caption writer who had left to get married. So she took off her coat. She sat down at the desk and made herself at home. And within three weeks, Claire was on the payroll and working dutifully and skillfully as a caption writer for Vanity Fair. It wasn't long before Claire was authoring articles for the magazine and was offered the position of assistant editor. Observers at the time took notice of the growing maturity of her articles. The early ones were mostly satirical and funny. As time passed, though, her articles became more serious and philosophical until she was writing of politics and economics with surprising wisdom. The human understanding expressed in these articles deepened issue by issue. And in 1933, after years of outstanding work, Claire was appointed the managing editor of Vanity Fair. In the midst of the Great Depression, the magazine's circulation was trending down, and the publisher considered overhauling the magazine and asked his staff for ideas. Claire submitted a proposal to reshape it into a photo journalism magazine, which she titled, Changing Vanity Fair into a Picture Magazine Called Life. Condé Nast did not pursue the idea, but another publisher who would become Mrs. Luce's husband would. Magazines then, even women's magazines, were all male dominated. As managing editor of Vanity Fair, Claire was one of the first females to serve in such a position for a major publication. And this is especially amazing if you consider the fact that Time Magazine did not have a, a female editor until 2013, a full 80 years after Claire headed Vanity Fair. Claire was truly ahead of her time. During this time, Claire also became an established playwright. She wrote over 10 plays, and her most famous play, The Women, opened on Broadway December 1936 and enjoyed a Broadway run of 657 performances. The Women was also made into a Hollywood movie twice, and the 1939 movie version, really the better one, I think, starred Norma Shear, Joan Crawford, and Rosalind Russell. It was second only to Gone with the Wind in box office receipts in 1939. The 2008 version was fun. It starred Meg Ryan, Eva Mendez, Annette Benning, Jada Pinkett Smith, and Bette Midler. The Women is such a distinct play, especially for its time, because not only was it written by a woman, but it also featured an all-female cast. There's only women in this play, but the play is all about men. While Claire wrote many things during her lifetime, the women would assuredly satisfy her teenage aspirations to write something that would be remembered. The play has been formed, uh, performed on stages around the globe almost continuously since 1936. A recent performance of the play was actually at the Spotlight Theater in Baltimore, uh, Maryland. This was uh, last year. We found another performance just this year uh, in uh, Edmonton, Canada. Come to the Stable, another of Claire's plays, was also made into a movie. It's a great old movie. It's a Turner classic. Rent it. Uh, but it was a comedy starring Oscar-winning Loretta Young and Celeste Holm as two nuns on a quest to build an abbey in America in a small New England town. The movie received an Academy Award for Best Writing Motion Picture Story. Really, if you want to see a good old-fashioned movie where the religious figures are good and virtuous, unlike the way they're often portrayed in modern movies, I recommend you rent this film. It was also while she was at Vanity Fair that Claire met the man who would become her husband, magazine publisher Henry Luce. They hit it off from the very first night that they met. Here's how one biographer described it. Luce, this was at another of these parties, Luce joined Booth for a long, wide-ranging conversation. He could be overbearing, even rude, but he was also an intense and fascinating conversationalist. When the party was over, they were still talking, and as they walked down to the empty lobby of the hotel where the party was to say goodbye, Luce told her quite unexpectedly that she was the kind of woman he had been looking for and that he planned to marry her. First meeting. You know, I met Mr. Lewis's son, Henry, when I founded the Institute because I wanted to ask someone in the family's permission to use her name 25 years ago. Um, and he was, uh, 
generous with his time and kind, but very much like his father, I think. Claire and Henry were married on November 23rd, 1935, and almost one year to the date, in November 1936, a picture magazine called Life was launched by Henry Luce. Claire's tenure at Vanity Fair, her why of everything curiosity of the world, made her transition to war journalist virtually inevitable. The transition was also something of a necessity. Travelers could only get State Department permission to travel to Europe if they were journalists. Over several years leading up to and during World War II, she served as a foreign correspondent for Life magazine in Europe and China. To get the news, she experienced bombing raids and endured the dangers and discomforts typical of war correspondents. She also endured the censorship of the time that all war correspondents had to live under. In Trinidad, she was put under house arrest when the British officials found a draft of a magazine she'd done for life about the poor military preparedness in Libya to be a bit too accurate for Allied comfort. Yet her astute observations were taken seriously and reportedly were given to her longtime friend Winston Churchill about revamping Middle East military policy. She helped communicate to civilians around the world what conditions were like abroad and the terrors of Nazism. Her observations drove her to publish her first nonfiction book titled Europe in the Spring. Claire's purpose in writing the book was to convince her fellow Americans of the dangers of isolationism. Most Americans were totally isolationists before World War II. The book was a vivid anecdotal account of what she observed during her four-month trip in, a Europe, in Europe preparing for war. The book was immensely popular. It reached number two on the New York Times bestseller list and was reprinted eight times. It was also persuasive and won her approval of the intellectuals of the era. The jacket of the book included an endorsement by the nationally respected journalist of the time, Walter Lippmann, confirming that Claire's account was devastatingly and absolutely truthful. Europe wasn't the only continent embroiled in battle. Claire and Henry Luce were both drawn to the Pacific Rim in the quest to gather information about the war between Japan and China for the pages of life. Claire interviewed and wrote a profile of General Douglas MacArthur, and by sure, sheer coincidence, the MacArthur profile was the cover story of Life magazine on December 8, 1941, the day after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. She went on to conduct interviews of such high-profile people as General Howard Alexander, commander of the British troops in the Middle East, India's Prime Minister Nehru, General Stilwell, commander of American troops in China, Burma, and India, and China's leader Chiang Kai-shek. And this is Mrs. Chiang Kai-shek. Um, they actually got to be uh, pretty good friends. And this was Chiang Kai-shek of free China, not communist China. That distinction isn't always made anymore. And she wasn't what some might call a helicopter journalist today in our 24-7 news cycle. Someone who lands in a hot spot, grabs a quick story, then leaves as quickly as they came. Claire spent a lot of time to listen to, especially to soldiers on the ground, the generals to the jeep drivers, to try to have an understanding of their situation. She really had a heart for our soldiers, and the truth is that they loved her too. She was doing all this while many women were still restricted from different walks of life and often discouraged from pursuing their dreams. In 1942, Claire was elected to her first term in Congress, serving as the representative for the 4th District of Connecticut that's around the Greenwich, Connecticut area. She based her platform on three goals, to win the war, to prosecute the war loyally and effectively, and to bring about a better world and durable peace with special attention to post-war security and employment here at home. Claire knew a lot more about war and its effects than many of her fellow congressmen and women. She'd been on the battlefront and she spent time listening to the soldiers on the ground from the generals to the jeep drivers. She took that knowledge with her to Congress and became the first female ever appointed to the House Military Affairs Committee. In 1944, Claire's only child, Anne, died in a tragic car accident. Anne and a classmate were dri driving back to Stanford University from a visit they had just had with Mrs. Luce in San Francisco. The tragedy devastated her and caused her to undertake a spiritual journey that resulted in her conversion to Catholicism in 1946 
under the tutelage of Monsignor Fulton J. Sheen. Monsignor Sheen would later say of Claire that she used Sarites, the Greek use of logic, in extended argument, quote, better than any person I've ever met. In the spring of 1947, Claire wrote about her conversion experience in what was called startlingly personal detail in a series of articles in McCall's magazine. You know, for the students and the young people here, before the internet and cable news, magazines really were a key part of communicating ideas and news for Americans. And McCall's was very, very widely read. My mother had it. Probably some of you in my age group, your mothers had it. Um, it was read by most American women. And uh, Mrs. Luce would go on to write and or edit articles and books promoting the Catholic Church and its causes throughout her life. For her second nonfiction work, Saints for Now, Claire persuaded 20 eminent authors to contribute short essays of a saint they admired. She then edited and compiled them. By now, Nazism and fascism had been defeated, but the world was still grappling with communism. Reacting to a nihilistic 1949 Atlantic Monthly Magazine article that presented the life of man as meaningless and hollow at the center, Claire embarked on a rebuttal to submit to the magazine. Her research took months and her writing took weeks. And when she finished, it was 16,000 words, and it was too long for an article and too short for a book. In it, Claire argued that the struggle-shaking man and the modern world was one of two irreconcilable worldviews, which she presented in the terms of God-fearing power of democracy, God-hating power of communism. The Regnery Company, still a wonderful publishing company whose current president is Margie Ross on the board of the Claire Booth Luce Policy Institute, they published the manuscript under this title, The Twilight of God, as one of its human affairs pamphlets, and you can still find it on the internet. It's very, very well done. In 1953, Claire did something no woman had done before. She became the first female ambassador to a major country, Italy. At the time, Italy was teetering on the brink between communism and democracy, and it was engaged in a bitter land dispute with Yugoslavia. Claire Boothluth was just the woman to help Italy even if she was truly going where no woman had gone before. And she wasn't just handed this ambassadorial post. She had to earn it. Much like the gumption she displayed asking Condé Nast for a job, she displayed a similar gumption when President Eisenhower called her in. She had done 100 speeches for him and worked hard for him. And he said, what, what, what did she want? She said, I want to be ambassador to Italy. And Claire always came prepared to persuade and presented three reasons to Eisenhower to prove that she was not only the right woman for the job, but more importantly, the right person. First, she said, President Eisenhower, I'm a known Catholic. And she said, this would gratify the millions of Catholics who had voted for him. Second, she said, her appointment would save him from having to send another of her faith to the Vatican. She was a two for one ambassador for Italy and the Vatican. And third, she said every female in the electorate would be pleased that a woman had finally gotten a number one diplomatic post. Ever the great persuader, Claire landed herself the job of a lifetime. Here she is being sworn in, uh, Chief Justice Fred Vinson and the Secretary of State. And once she had the job, she set out to make a difference in Italy. While she had the support of the Italian government, some of the Italian newspapers were not as kind to the incoming ambassador. One biographer wrote, they treated the prospect of a female envoy with sarcasm, ribaldry, or outright scorn. A cartoon in the monarchist publication, Candido, showed the United States embassy flag in Rome fringed with negligee lace. Claire became the bet, the butt, of such street vulgarisms as, the ambassador doesn't tote a fountain pen, the last noun in Italian being a double entendre for penis. One of the major assignments of her tenure in Italy was to resolve the long simmering crisis between Italy and Yugoslavia over the port of Trieste. Claire's role in resolving the Trieste crisis was not widely known, beyond high-ranking diplomatic circles at the time, but her insight and her guidance 
and her back channel work were key. Next door to Italy was, at the time, communist Yugoslavia. And at the end of the war, this little port everybody wanted had been uh, granted jointly to the US, to Great Britain, and to Yugoslavia. And uh, the Yugoslavs, uh, Tito, was just adamant that he was going to take it over. Well, Claire, using her skills, uh, found out that they were hungry in Yugoslavia. And she discovered that a half a million tons of wheat secretly given to Yugoslavia was the key. There were other things she did too, but that's my favorite part. Um, and uh, the negotiations over many months that made possible the final Trieste Agreement between Yugoslavia and Italy. And the agreement endeared her in the United States to the Italian people, because Italy, Italy got to keep it, and established her cre credentials within the diplomatic corps as well. While she was in Italy, she faced something actually far more dangerous than angry Italians. She began to feel fatigued, lost feeling in her feet, found that her teeth were becoming loose. She was losing her hair. Blood tests revealed she was suffering from arsenic poisoning. As Claire was an outspoken, uh, an outspoken opponent of communism, some immediately assumed foul play by her communist foes in that area. The CIA was called in to investigate, and what they discovered will surprise you all. The source of the poison that was slowly killing Mrs. Luce was not a communist regime, but the very bedroom she sought sanctuary in. And the uh, ambassador's residence was a beautiful, stately old Italian home, and the ceilings were all ornately painted. Above Claire's bed were clusters of beautifully painted roses, which were gorgeous to the naked eye, but secretly deadly. The paint contained arsenic of lead. And a new laundry room with washing machines that shook had been installed above her bedroom. And the shaking caused the paint dust to fall on her morning coffee, on her bed, when she slept, everything throughout the room. The ceiling was quietly renovated, and the story of the poisoning was treated as a state secret for some time to avoid embarrassing the Italian government. When Claire left Italy, due in large part to her health issues, they could see how thin she looked here, she left behind an Italy firmly on the road to democratic freedom. One of Italy's oldest newspapers wrote, quote, perhaps never in the history of, in the whole of history has a great nation owed so much to so small, fragile, and gentle a woman. Her post-ambassadorial life was fascinating, too. In 1959, Castro led a revolution in Cuba, and Claire and Henry strongly opposed him, as did most Americans. They even went so far as to start anti-Castro groups. Claire was not afraid to voice her objections to communism. She participated in a nationally broadcast radio debate where she proudly stated, quote, our capitalist economy has many faults. I am the first to acknowledge them. But the fact that capitalism has faults does not prove that communism is virtuous, nor does it prove that communism is a cure, except as a guillotine might be called a cure for a case of dandruff. She closed her argument with this. My opponent, I think she's talking about the guy in the end with his hand on his face, is a self-deluded man. He is fighting against our system of Christian democracy a system which he does not in his heart wish to destroy, and defending a system that he could not bear to live under. In an October 1962 Life magazine, Claire warned of a global double bind if the US permitted Soviet missiles to become operational on the island of Cuba. Should America be forced into an engagement against the Soviets in other hemispheres, she argued, the US would face risk at home from flanking attacks just off our southern shore. And she urged support in this article for President Kennedy, should he decide to act to prevent a Cuban-based Soviet outpost. Claire Booth Luce rarely equivocated. She formed her positions logically and expressed them clearly and on occasion irreverently. In 1977, four years after the Roe v. Wade Supreme Court abortion decision, Claire penned a lengthy article in the Human Life Review entitled The Kilpatrick Position. James A. Kilpatrick, uh, a well-known conservative columnist, had written an article calling her one of America's most respected columnists and one of his favorite uh, pundits, although he was a little equivocal on the issue. The purpose of this particular article was to respond 
to what she said was, quote, a curious tendency of many intellectuals to cop out on a question which is not only of profound, even agonizing concern to millions of fellow citizens, but of extraordinary moral and political significance for the future of America, question of life. She began the article by drawing a parallel between the mistreatment of slaves and a child in utero. She called both issues multidimensional, raising religious, moral, economic, political, legal, and constitutional questions. Yet she argues the core question in both cases is scientific and rooted in theology. She wrote, was the Negro race, although clearly belonging to the genus mankind, nevertheless a subhuman species? Was the black man biologically inferior to the white man, or was he biologically his equal and consequently entitled to those rights guaranteed by the Constitution to all men? Is the child in utero a human being, a person, or is the fetus non-human or subhuman matter? And if so, at what point in time does the fetus become a human being? Both Supreme Courts, uh, the Taney Court in Dred Scott and the Burger Court in Roe v. Wade, she said, studiously avoided weighing the answers of contemporary science in reaching their decisions. And in doing so, they threw the issues into the political, political sphere and divided nation. And, you know, just last week at a summit we had at the Institute in Florida, uh, the same question was being raised um, 40 years later. Bay Buchanan was excellent and kind uh, to those who were disagreeing and sort of stated in the same way. Is it a baby or is it not? And if it is a baby, what do we do to protect it? The 1960s was a time of national unrest over the Vietnam War and campus riots on college campuses. Uh, Mrs. Lewis is in Hawaii by now, and she wrote an editorial in Hawaii's Star Bulletin newspaper entitled, Handling Campus Activists. She wrote, the widespread disorders have made America realize that if academic order is not soon restored, the whole education is bound to disintegrate. The universities will either have to close down or yield over to their politically oriented faculty members and the activists with the consequences they will turn into breeding grounds for young revolutionaries. This was 50 years ago. What foresight she had. Have you all been following the news? The universities didn't close down, but most are now totally dominated by the left. And whereas it used to be strenuous disagreement with conservative ideas, now they try to shut it down. When the young women who work with us try to have lectures at university after university, they put every barricade and roadblock in the way because those rioters from many years ago are now running the university. And Claire argued that the soft approach of appeasement adopted by university administrators only provoked more demonstrations increased in size and violence. And she laments the consequences, the death of reason, debate on campus, civil discourse. She wrote, here the writer wishes to make clear that in a free society, all questions or causes, academic or politi political, which interest students are properly debatable questions. Civil rights, ecology, fair trials for the Chicago 7, these were the issues back then, the academic merits of ROTC training, Vietnam, disarmament, housing, to name a few that were hot, uh, should be debated by students. It's not only reasonable, it's desirable that they should be. It's also desirable that students should listen to speakers and lecturers and faculty members who present different sides of questions. But reasoned debate is not the method by which the new left activists chose to resolve the questions. And later in the article, she raises an issue that some today are raising today about the riots and the disturbances we see on our campuses and in the streets. Who are the agitators behind the riots? She wrote, here one should mention a situation that deserves far more attention than it's getting. Many of the activists who appeared during the campus demonstrations are not enrolled students. They are organized agitators who have been sent into the crowd of students to egg them to violence. She wrote this 50 years ago. Perhaps we can file this under the uh, nothing new under the sun. There are still an awful lot of non-students disrupting conservative speakers, campuses all over America. Claire went on to serve the Nixon, Ford, and Reagan administrations in appointed positions. And I have to confess, I'm not sure who the gentleman is, but it was such a beautiful picture of her that I wanted to, I wanted to run this one. 
And she was or awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom by President Reagan in 1983. President Reagan loved strong, smart, pretty conservative women like Claire Booth Luce. And we have the miniature of it in our headquarters office. It was a gift from one of our board members here. The picture, she is Mrs. Luce's namesake. She is Claire Luce. And she loves to tell stories about her grandmother. We'd love to have her speak for us. On a lighter note, we remember Claire for her quick wit and her quotable quips, since many of them transcend, transcend time as well. She had many things to say about women, men, feminism, and the battle of the sexes, some of them quite pointed and cheeky. If God wanted us to think with our wombs, why did he give us a brain? I refuse the compliment that I think like a man. Thought has no sex. One either thinks or one does not. Because I'm a woman, I must make unusual efforts to succeed. If I fail, no one will say, she doesn't have what it takes. They will say, women don't have what it takes. That was 50 years ago. There is nothing harder than the softness of indifference. She wrote a lot about politics and politicians. The politicians, she wrote, were talking themselves red, white, and blue in the face. And then she said, she wrote, they say that women talk too much. If you worked in Congress, you know that the filibuster was invented by men. <laughs> and then this one we use a lot at the Institute. Courage is the ladder on which all the other virtues mount. It's the uh, tagline for our newsletter. And it's so true, especially for young women facing a huge, hostile, left-wing feminist university, to get the courage to stand up and uh, take a position is really consequential. But by far, my favorite is the one that's on our coffee mug that we give to most of our guest speakers here, no good deed goes unpunished. Uh, those of you that are regulars to the luncheon know that's always on our coffee mug. Claire Booth Luce was a brilliant woman with an innate drive to find out the why of everything. She blazed many trails for women throughout her life, and she did so always with grace and confidence. Neither her sex nor her circumstances could hold her back. It's why we name Claire Booth Luce after her for creating the next generation of women leaders after her. And our institute uh, is, is working with many young women around the country, summit seminars, mentoring lunches, fellowships, our campus lecture program. If you want to find out about it or support our work, just go to our website, cblpi.org. Now, when Claire Booth Luce died on October 9, 1987, Time magazine eulogized the writer. Uh, Henry ha had died several years before. Editor, stateswoman, and called her the preeminent Renaissance woman of the 20th century. Indeed, she was. Thank you. I think we have a little bit of time for questions. Michelle, that was wonderful. Thanks so much. Um, we have time for questions here. If, if anyone has a question they'd like to share uh, and have Michelle address. I know she's done a lot of research on Claire Booth Luce. I found it fascinating. I thought the book titles, thank you for sharing those. I'm yeah. actually going to, I've written them down. I'm going to be searching on Amazon later to see if I can find some of those myself. Well, people today don't realize what a prolific writer she right. was. She was a very fine writer. And she was essentially homeschooled, for those of you who are fans of that. She, four years of formal schooling. Which I thought was amazing. She didn't uh, actually go into school until she was 12 years old. That's right. Her father, when he was with the family before he abandoned him, was an itinerant musician. So they move here and here and here. And it's the argument that once a child learns to read, a child who's bright and curious, you can learn an awful lot on your own. Yeah, that's incredible. <laughs> um, any questions? And I know that um, you have uh, so many chapters on campuses with student leaders asking uh, for speakers, and very much in the mold mm -hmm. of the speakers that you all are hosting out on campuses that students can ask um, to come speak, and you all assist in selecting and, and even financing that. Who are some of the speakers today? Who are some of the writers today um, that you follow that you think um, really kind of follow sure. in the mold of Claire Booth Luce? We do, work, we do have a small number of Luce Society chapters, which we just began because some girls wanted a woman's conservative group, mm -hmm. activist group on their campus. But we work with all the uh, different groups, YAF, uh, Students for Life. We work with all of them. Um, I'll just tell you some of the lectures we had this week. Um, Ying Ma 
who is a right. Chinese uh, immigrant a family. She spoke about immigration at Berkeley. Um, wonderful speech she gives. Um, she gave it last week in Orlando at our summit. Um, at Mount Holyoke, we had uh, Allie Stuckey and... Uh, who? Bev Hallberg. Oh, oh yes. Terrific. Right, about women in the media, and Allie talked about all kinds of things. Um, Bay Buchanan, who was U.S. Treasurer under uh, President Reagan, is always very, very popular. Uh, Michelle Malkin, she's hard to get out because she's uh, busy doing so many things. Um, those are some of the key ones. Uh, Margie Ross does a wonderful, inspiring speech about um, how to be a successful professional woman along with a career. Rachel Campos Duffy, who was recently on Fox, she gives a great talk. Um, those are some of them. That's um, great. It's, it's on our website. Uh, all those are on our website. Uh, wait, wait for the mic here, please. Oh, <laughs> so it gets on the tape. I'm just curious with all these speakers, like you said at Berkeley, how are the speakers greeted on campus as opposed to Ben Shapiro? Yes. Um, we, we set up our Berkeley ones to be sure to protect our women speakers. Often uh, we have to have bodyguards. Um, we, are, we work very closely with security. We've never had um, much of an incident yet. Um, but it's frightening. It's frightening the way the left wants to shut down mm -hmm. conservative thought. They don't disagree with it anymore. So it's a, it's a top priority. We spend a lot of money. A bodyguard for a day is $1,000, but we do it to protect uh, those who really feel they need it. Anybody who asks me for it, I, we do it. Right, Elizabeth? Elizabeth's our lecture director here. Unfortunately, that's something yep. that's necessary in this yep, day and age. Yeah, it Lauren, is. Lauren has a question right here. What a great talk. Um, I was just curious if you could speak more about her relationship with Henry, because she was obviously such an accomplished woman. It would be hard, I imagine, to find a man who wouldn't be threatened. Yes. Um, it, was, it, was a, it was a very fascinating relationship. They're both towering personalities. Um, they loved each other very much. Uh, they went through life. Uh, when she became ambassador, he was just uh, getting into semi-retirement. And he said to her, okay, I'll come over there six months a year. So she arrives. What is the first thing an ambassador without a, without a wife has to do? She had to hire a wife. Oh, wow. So she hired Letitia Baldridge. Some of you may know oh, of her. Wow. She did both sides. She ended up being Jackie Kennedy's social secretary. Sure. Oh. Letitia, I believe, was just out of, I think, out of Wellesley. They both had to learn Italian very quickly. But Henry came. Henry studiously tried not to interfere, which was very hard, of course, because he had opinions on everything. But they, they were a stunning couple. Um, they loved each other very much. She became very close to his sons. I told her I met with Henry, the son of Henry, to get his permission. Um, the, uh, the archives here, are uh, Library of Congress, is filled with boxes of letters, so there was no email back then, between Claire and the stepsons. They were very, very close. And as I said, she lost her own little girl at a very young age. It was a devastating thing for her. Uh, Henry and she are both uh, buried at Memphkin, which was their hunting lodge in South Carolina. Cindy and Russia and I went to see it with a dear friend uh, not too long ago. They willed it to, what, what was that order? The uh, Trappist, silent. They were silent. But we got to have a tour, and we saw the graves. It's Claire and Henry and a couple of others from the family. It's so beautifully done. It was a fascinating, I'm sure challenging, I'm sure difficult at times, but they loved each other. And when he passed away, uh, suddenly, many years before her, she really missed him. Uh, did she have other children besides the 19-year-old that died? No. She had the one child with the first husband, George Brokaw. Um, that marriage was very difficult because of him, and um, I feel sure she would have liked more, but she didn't. And then she married Henry, and he had the two sons, and uh, they became her children. And she loved them very much, and they loved her. Henry, when I met with him, the son, he, he just spoke with such fondness of her. Uh, and her granddaughter, Claire Luce, whose picture I showed you, once Henry passed away, Mrs. Luce would ask the granddaughters, different ones, to go on the travels with her. And it was said that Claire was her favorite because she was so gracious and kind and, and helped her in her travels. And Claire, when she speaks about her grandmother, you just 
It's, it's wonderful. Another, I'd mention to you, the very best bio, uh, this doesn't have the cover on it, it's Stephen Shattig. Um, Stephen Shattig was a Goldwater speechwriter. It was published in 1970, so she had 17 more years after that. There was a more recent bio done that um, I was very disappointed with, um, the way it was organized and sort of imagined, she imagined things about Mrs. Luce. Um, it's very long and uh, technically well written, lots of good pictures. But if you want to read a bio, a good bio, this one ended in 1970. We're hoping mm -hmm. to get some funding so we could finish this. Um, I've gotten permission from uh, Stephen Shattig's son is Congressman John Shattig, who was a uh, congressman from Arizona for many, many years. And he went back to the other kids, the estate. And we have permission to finish it now. It's not a, a fawning book at all. It's just very straightforward. It's, just, see, it's none of the sensationalism of the more recent ones. It's just very straightforward. And you can't read this without thinking, what an incredible woman Mrs. Luce was. And at that time, the time of my great-grandmother, your great-great-grandmother, so long ago, and almost never taught in women's studies, <laughs> because we know that women's studies is about liberal women, not conservative women. And she was pro-life and anti-communist and pro-free enterprise. But we're keeping her alive, and you all can too, because she was such a remarkable woman. Well, thank you so much, Michelle. I really appreciate thank you bringing all of this uh, story of Claire Booth Luce to us. Um, she's somebody, as, as uh, Michelle mentioned, who served for um, a number of years on the, the Heritage Foundation Board of Trustees. And Heritage's highest honor is our Claire Booth Luce Award uh, that we have given to Margaret Thatcher. Um, and a number of other very distinguished, uh, primarily Americans, but uh, Margaret Thatcher is a patroness um, of Heritage, and we have our Thatcher Center here. But when she uh, stepped down as prime minister, um, she received the Claire Booth Luce Award from the Heritage Foundation. I really can't think of a, a more fitting mm -hmm. awardee, uh, someone very much um, in the style of Claire and Booth Luce. And can't you imagine that Margaret Thatcher and Claire Booth Luce oh, that would have been a fabulous sitting having tea? Oh, fabulous to conversation. To that. <laughs> that would have been wonderful. So thank you all for joining us, and thank you, C-SPAN, uh, for joining us today. We're going to continue the conversation over lunch for those of you who can stay and join us. So I invite you to uh, step outside, and we'll continue the conversation. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you.